you know um i say that to say i learned more from my mother's praying while she was an addict that made me i learned more about that than most preachers ever preach it because it was more of an action it was more of a hey i messed up but i know i need you i can't explain it but i know i need you Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Teflon John, coming to you courtesy of the Art of Reinvention talk show. And today, I have a very special guest all the way from Bedford, Virginia. Your boy came to here from Bedford, Virginia to drive an hour to rock with your boy, Teflon. My man, Travis Thomas. What's up, bro? Yeah, glad to have you, man. Glad to have you. So, um, what, what I want you guys to do before we get into the interview, take a moment, like the page share this interview and subscribe to my youtube channel a lot of people want to know how they can support the brand i tell you what you can do it by not spending a dollar is just sharing and liking the actual content and leave a comment down down below all right so now we got our guest travis thomas so go ahead and tell the people who you are man yes sir um my name is travis thomas i'm a police officer in the town of Bedford. my new position in the town of Bedford is actually a community resource officer so I've been in Bedford. I grew up in Lynchburg, and I've been in Bedford since 2010. Okay. So, Travis, let's talk about, I see you coming down here. You know, you, you've you been in Bedford, law enforcement. But I know it wasn't always like that when I met you on Facebook, right? So let's go back. And when I met you, you, you were coaching. Yes, sir. Right? So let's talk about um, why and how did you get into coaching? Um, 2010, I first moved to Bedford. Um, and I was just trying to find a way to impact the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to figure out a way that how could I talk to youth? I felt like I was definitely not comfortable where I was, and I didn't want the next generation. I didn't want another younger kid um, to come up and feel like I felt. So what I did was I knew kids love sports. Um, I reached out to a guy, HT, I'll never forget, Asked him, uh, did he have a team available? He was like, show up this Friday. He was uh -huh. like, you don't get to be a part of the draft. He was like, because it's just some kids that's left <laughs> over. We give you yeah. that team. Yeah. And um, I was able to jump. I, we, start, we started as the Mavericks, and uh, I was able to coach a team. But the biggest thing was I was able to, like, instill values. I was strategic about that. Like, gotcha. every practice, it wasn't about – just basketball. Uh -huh. I would have guest speakers come each week, uh -huh. talk to the kids about different things. And um, that was just like my form of ministry. That was my piece. Gotcha. So when you say form of ministry, I remember, uh, I think Mark Trey had invited me to speak at one of the churches in Bedford. It was like to the youth. I think, I believe I had like a basketball tournament or something going on. So could you tell me, like, explain more, take a deeper dive into the connection of the so, ministry with basketball? The Matt, uh, we start, I started off coaching. We were the Mavericks. From Mavericks, um, God placed something on my heart called Hoya, which stands for Help Our Youth Excel. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Patterson was a great friend of mine growing up in Lynchburg. He just passed, and I was like, he was a good kid. Uh -huh. And I remember we went up, we grew up going to Jubilee, having basketball tournaments, um, and being in that area. And I was like, I wanted something that strong there. Mm -hmm. So when I sat back and I thought about the vision, um, Hoya came on my heart. And I started doing rec teams that was Hoya. It stands for Help Our Youth Excel. And that grew to us having multiple teams of just rec teams. Um, I was coaching multiple teams at one time. None of them was my children. My children wasn't old enough to play at the time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and then when I met you, um, I always wanted Hoya to be something bigger than sports. I wanted it to be youth and family development. Mm -hmm. Sports is just so easy to draw yeah. to because so many kids play sports. Um, so what we did was we have a March Madness tournament. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the kids going to come for the March Madness tournament. They want a trophy. They want the medal. They want to play basketball. So the year we invited you, I said, well, let's add a twist to it. Let's keep the March Madness theme, mm -hmm. but have different speakers come up and talk about, like, how to deal with anger. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of youth deal with anger. A yeah, lot of adults right. deal with anger. You're right. Right? So we was able to create an environment. I believe I had you speak to the adults. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I had another gentleman come speak to the teens, and we was able to just break them up. 
And um, man, I was happy. Like just to see how it turned out. To see how it turned out, we had yeah. a great turnout that came that Friday night. Uh -huh. But um, I mean, pa that many parents showing up was a big thing, because a lot of times it's hard to get the parents in the it room. Is, it is, it is. Right. So not only did we have a good turnout with the teens, um, and we had a great turnout with the parents, and then the next day, of course, for the tournament, the kids showed out for the tournament too. So. I felt like we killed two birds with one stone. Got gotcha. you. So what's your most memorable moment of coaching? Because I know when I coach down here playing football, you always get the one kid or someone that kind of tugs at your heart. Or it's scary, like you'll see yourself in somebody. Yeah. Right? And I remember I had like anger issues and I was being like rebellious towards the coach and I ended up seeing some of myself in a kid. Like, So what is your most memorable moment or have you ever dealt with that? I see that in a lot of kids in general. But I wouldn't say that I would have a m more memorable moment than another one. Uh -huh. I feel like the moment when it finally dawned on me as far as coaching was, as I started off in rec, when I was growing up, like, only the elite did the travel. So you couldn't coach travel if you weren't like that elite guy. Yeah. You yeah, couldn't coach school guy. ball unless you had a degree or you went to school. Mm -hmm. So my memory that just hit me, was like when they allowed me to coach school and I didn't go apply for a job. Like they I reached out you. to me. Uh -huh. And that was just like the impact from like the kids that I've had previous situations. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that that's my most memorable thing. And I remember when I got that opportunity, because um, I'm big on like, I'm always going to pray before practice start. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask nobody if they're comfortable about it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Never had a problem with it. Um, and everybody that I coach don't believe in God, but they don't have a problem with me praying either because it's a relationship, mm -hmm. conversations. Yep. Um, yep. And just being able to keep those small principles and keep those small standards, that was the moment because the moment was like, God allowed this to happen for me. Gotcha. I'm nobody special. Like, I didn't play school ball and was this crazy person that was in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been very successful at coaching school ball too. Like, it's not about winning and losing, but we win a lot. And I think it's more because of the stuff that we do off the court, mm -hmm. about executing at a high level, taking ownership, um, finding your role. Everybody on the team got a role. Right. Your role might not be to go out here and score this amount of points. Mm -hmm. You might be a defensive role. Wait your time. Yes. You may not always be a starter. Mm -hmm. You may have to work hard to take that person's spot. Um, and then – the role that I'm able to embrace is to that child who may not have the father or mother that's like to stand out. Like the game is no respect to person. Uh -huh. Like mm -hmm. if you're willing to put in the work, it don't matter who their mom is. It don't matter who their dad is. Yep. Like if you're willing to put in work, that will put you past anything. Like mm -hmm. you can c accomplish anything Yeah, you're right. You're if you're right. willing to put in the work. So I think that was that moment to notice that like I got this opportunity and – it was given to me. I didn't do anything great to make these doors open or to do anything to make it happen. Gotcha. And that's, and that's amazing, man, because I think when you're that passionate and you can hear your passion, right, um, you'll always get through to those kids. And it's always kids that need that mentorship, always kids that need that relationship and an outlet other than their parents. Oh, and I needed it. So a lot of times mm -hmm. I'm sitting here, um, God's dealing with me while I'm talking to them about stuff. Yeah. Right. So I'm telling them to respect their parents and I'm telling them to do that. And I'm like, well, how is your relationship with your mom? It don't matter whether she was in your life or not. How your relationship with your dad? It don't matter if he was in your life or not. Um, give everybody everything. Well, am I giving my kids my everything? So mm -hmm. as, as as I'm being hard on them, it's forcing me to also like look at it. I ain't going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. Yeah. But we can wake up every day to be like, what can we do to today yeah. to make sure that we be and, in the best version of ourselves. So, so how, how would you say like the introspection of yourself from coaching, how, how does that help you to be the man you are now? Um, it makes me want to be accountable and it makes me never want to settle. Every day um, I have people tell me like how I'm doing this great and I'm mm -hmm. doing that and why I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm nowhere where I need to be. Exactly, exactly. So I, I can't get comfortable. I appreciate the nice compliments. Uh -huh. Um, but I always move or plan as if like, I'm not doing enough, always got to do better. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, if anything, I feel like that's what it's done for me. Yeah. Cause the one thing I hate hearing over and over is you have potential. 
Yeah. And I know, like you said, I have personal things that I want to do. And I know, OK, man, I could be further along. I, I could be doing better. How do you deal with or how does a person deal with? Because we're talking to a lot of adults now. And it's like when you hearing that you have the potential and, and potential energy, stored energy, kinetic energy is energy in, in motion. How do you convert that potential energy that's in here, that's in here into something that they can see, something to help their dreams and goals come to fruition? Being around people that's going to hold you accountable. Um, a lot of time, potential, some people can't see a potential if they're not a visionary. So, like, I go in a gym, mm -hmm. and I can quickly see, I've been doing it long enough where I can quickly see who on the team, who shouldn't be on the team, if they want me to keep them on the team, how I can mm -hmm. play that out. But being a visionary helps you see the potential quick. Because, like you said, I, a lot of people got potential. Mm -hmm. I look at my kids every day, and I see the potential. Like, I feel like that's my job as a father to see their potential. Like I can't see when they're getting on my nerves mm -hmm. and they make me mad, and I want to tell them really how I feel like about them. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm being a father to the potential of them. Got you. Right. So word, word. I'm telling them like you can be anything. Uh -huh. Like I ain't telling you this because it's a nice story in mm -hmm. a movie line. Mm -hmm. Like man, you do this so great, and you strong, and you smart, uh -huh. and you sweet, and you cut like. To see the potential, but you got to want it. You got to. I, I can't want that potential for yeah. anybody. And I, that's what scares me a lot for the youth these days. Mm -hmm. And when I say the youth, because a lot of times adults are, they already set in their mind about what they want to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just on an accident, they already set in their mind. But when I see the children, it scares me because, like, you have all this potential, but you just wasting it. Yeah, man. And time ain't promised to nobody. Yeah. I went to school with people that died at a young age. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I seen a post. I shared a post of a friend. Um, it said retirement isn't promised anyone. Live your life. I think some people, when they say live their life and YOLO, you only live once. It's kind of scary because you'll see people with potential that could do great things, but they're making bad choices. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses, whatever society says that you should have. And I think instead of making the right sacrifices and making the right choices, right? They're just living life according to everyone else's standard. You know what I mean? What do you, what would you say to, to to those people that know they have the potential, but like you said, they're just around the wrong people? Um, Me personally, I would say like seek some type of counseling or find somebody you can talk to. And the reason why I say that is you can know you have all the potential in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was the biggest person um, my first time getting canceling was last year where everybody saw all this potential. Travis didn't see it. Yeah. I woke up every day and I did what I did because I was purposeful in doing it. But I didn't see myself like everybody else saw me. Yeah. Right. So I asked people to do that to know yourself. Some pe a lot of people really, really, really don't know their self. Mm -hmm. And we go years and years yeah. without knowing ourselves, And that means everything. Um because you'll never be able to tap into that potential if you don't know yourself. Mm -hmm. You will do things to make other people happy. You'll do what somebody else said that, oh, I think you should do this. Mm -hmm. I think you should cook. You really can't cook. Yeah. Like, I'm talking about purpose. Like, what yeah. is it that you can do that nobody else can do? Got you. All of us have that. Yep. Yeah, and it's crazy that you say that. My last podcast episode was uh, off to see the wizard. And I was basically comparing people's paths. To like Dorothy and the gang going down the yellow brick road, trying to meet somebody to get something that was already in here. Courage, you know, boldness, whatever they were looking for. But I think we live in a society now with a bunch of buzzwords, self-awareness. So you're talking about knowing yourself. And I would love to talk about that because I think kids, adults, like everybody's dealing with that. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I think now that, like you said, it's sending people down a false tra tra trajectory or false path. And they'll spend years to realize, you know what, man, this is not what I wanted to do. This is not my goal. That was not my dream. That was not my vision. They'll end up married to somebody that they <laughs> wow. don't want to be married to, punching the clock they didn't want to punch. Yeah. And it'll take them years to realize, you know what, instead of being uncomfortable, telling someone no or nah, I'm good, for that moment, they'll be uncomfortable for 30, 40 years. In a wilderness. That you do not have to be in yeah. for that long, but we do it. We walk circle and circle around. Mm -hmm. It's comfortable. We're not dying. We eating. Mm -hmm. We living. Everything good. Yeah. But it's something out there that's so much better that a lot of people don't even care to tap yeah. into. Because it began to frustrate me, man. Like when I when I looked at 
like my son going to college, right? And so I'm looking at the opportunities and thankful for, you know, how God has blessed him and, you know, he's he's got a, a good head on his shoulders. And we did all these college visits and I'm looking at just the opportunities, right? And at times I, I rewind back. Did I take advantage of every opportunity? You know what I mean? And so it's kind of making me question and, and look at things different. Am I doing what I'm doing now because this is the path someone chose for me mm-hmm. and I was just content? Yeah. Or am I actually going down a path that where God wants me? And I think sometimes in life, you may make decent money, right? Not realizing that God has more for you if you're willing to step out of that comfort zone yeah. and really do what you were meant to, to do. But that's a million times frustrated, too, when you sit back, especially me in general. I'll think about that. Like, I'm probably doing okay in life. Mm-hmm. But, God, can I just get a glimpse about, like, what? Because I know I could be doing uh-huh. Uh-huh. better. But that's a mindset. If you're not around nobody that's making you think like that, mm-hmm. um, I mentioned to you, my trades, like one of my dearest friends. Yeah. I have to be around people like that because if I can see, whether it's not talk to him, just see what he's doing, mm-hmm. whether he's supposed to someone, it reminds me to have that positive thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of people get people around them that it's fine with them being in the wilderness. Man, let me tell you, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's crazy because I remember when I, when I was a personal trainer. Being around, per, you know, being around people trying to work out. I remember me struggling, trying to work out, get in shape. And I'm back to that now, trying to get back in shape. But you can lie to yourself and figure out your what I call comfort language. I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, We'll start tomorrow. It's just one cake. Yeah, It's just one day, right? And I think sometimes without that person in your ear to remind you, no, you said da-da-da-da-da, right? You said you would do this, you know what I mean? So... I think um, I was thinking the other day, my wife told me, I think it was either two days ago. She said, don't talk about it, be about it, you know. And I think you need that. Some people, I think, are uncomfortable with hearing the truth and hearing what they need to hear versus hearing what they want to hear. They'll justify it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They'll justify anything internally. To make it seem like you ain't got to do all that. Uh You don't have to not eat like you can eat in moderation right mm-hmm, they'll mm-hmm. take what a plan that you need to execute mm-hmm, the standard mm-hmm. is not the standard no more yeah yeah you're right and then it's like what is the actual standard because but that self mm-hmm. would that that would almost have to be the person within has to write the standard and stick to it yeah because your standard might not be my standard exactly exactly um exactly. so yeah <laughs> yeah because even with like you know um now that we're going out down that path it's just because i think you really hit the nail on the head with self-awareness. And some people, I think they'll be in a, a situation around a group of people, realize, man, you know, I want to work on my finances, but, you know, they always doing this or going out or blah, blah, blah. Or, man, I want to start focusing on my credit or, hey, I want to focus on my family. How how does that person, you know, like what, what advice would you give to that person that's afraid to have that uncomfortable conversation and say just these words, no, nah, I'm good? Yeah. Um, so I will be transparent and let people know that that's something I'm struggling with as far as being a good steward over it. Mm -hmm. But that part of me that wakes up every day and want to put my best foot forward, that's the part of me that always gives me the the edge, the leverage to say, all right, we're going to fix it. This is how we're going to fix it. Um, but you got to be real with yourself mm-hmm. because what will happen is you doing the things of finances and once it's gone, it's gone. Exactly. And then when it's usually gone, you probably like, oh, I could have did this with my money yep. and I could have did that with my money. I know believers, they big on tithing and they'll tithe and they'll say, you know, everything going to be all right. But then you ain't being a good steward over what's left after you tithe. Exactly. Um, and really, if you learn how to master that, like. I don't necessarily think if you got a financial problem, you just got a discipline problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I won't necessarily say that it's just a financial problem because if you're not doing things right in your finances, nine times out of ten is other stuff that you have problems in in areas of your life because it's a discipline problem. So I would say to the person, like, the discipline, like the discipline you is the best version of you. Mm -hmm. Like figure out how can I say no. No is no. Get people involved that care. 
let your children know, hey, this is why we're not doing this. Mm -hmm. Like, I got a vision for our finances. I would love to have a trust set up for y'all one day. Yeah. I would love for us to go on vacations and um, not have to worry about, oh, where we staying at or mm -hmm. planning the year out. And me, the biggest part with me with the finances, I, I talk to God like I'm talking to you. So uh -huh. I'm like, God, why not just give me the blessing? Because you know my heart. Yeah, yeah. I will give. Uh -huh. I don't have it and I give. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I'm looking for like who can I who can I bless today? Mm -hmm. Like, bro, you may not need to bless nobody today. You <laughs> yeah. just need to put this aside. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But finding that discipline, the discipline is everything. And I would just tell that person like, you have to write that discipline down. A lot of people don't know what their finances look like. So anything you got to have a vision for it. Mm -hmm. So if it's a financial thing, you got to have a vision. This is what I want for me financially. And when you have that vision, then you can be realistic. If I have a vision of this is what I want financially, mm -hmm. well, how much money am I making a year? Yeah, I might have to change some things. Whether it means I got to get another job, yeah. I got to work another job. Mm -hmm. But you doing it with a vision. Some people work. 40 jobs and still don't have no money because they don't have a vision of what they yeah, doing. They, they get the money, no they value. spending, mm -hmm. um, trying to keep up with somebody. I don't care about being rich. Like, yeah. I'm the type of person, like, if you see me out, pray for me because I don't know what I'm wearing. I don't really care. Yeah. That's not my, I'm not the, like, dress up kind of uh -huh, guy, uh -huh. go get cool or whatever. Um, yeah, cause I just want the freedom, man. Yeah. I want, like, if me and my wife or, you know, me and the kids or my mom, if I went to go somewhere, I'm going to be to go somewhere. Yeah. And, the way I look at it now is like over the last year or two, I think God has really opened up my eyes to like my talents, gifts. You know, people say side hustles, right? If you put the amount of effort you were put in like your job, stressing over this and that, and to just stay in the course, man, you're seeing so many people, right? That's where your money's going into. Their, yeah. their, their brand. Vision. Yeah. <laughs> because they, they, they actually stuck with it. So when you say start off with coaching, right? And you had that passion, and now you're, you know, it seems like you're, 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 you're a brother that's big on vision, right? And to me, if you can see it, it's like when you were young. That's my call, right? I think that's the one of the worst things that happen to adults or teenagers. We stop having imagination. I think imagination to a child is faith to an adult. Oh, absolutely. We just realize, oh, this is the real world, the program. You can't. No, like the the fact that you can dream about a, a new car or whatever. That drives you. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you can tell a person, you can tell a person's beliefs, their belief system, their core values by their actions. And as a child, they'll be out there acting like Spider-Man or acting like the athlete. Where where does that go? Like, what? why do you think, and you'll see it even coaching kids, you have to remind them at some age, it's like it just goes. Yeah. Um, being around, I, I feel like it goes wherever your environment is because – for you said it as adults, but I know kids who lose division as a child. Mm -hmm. You have some children in it and they grow up in families like, don't be stupid. You can't do that. Yep. You know, you, you can't be no doctor. Like they hiring down the street at that factory. You can get on there and, mm -hmm. and get you a good job, get you a good for. So to some families, that's killed from the beginning. Yeah. You're told that you're going to work for this or, hey, go get on at the bank. The bank will take care of you. They got mm -hmm. good benefits. Mm -hmm. That's cute. You have other people who live in cultures where the parents saying, hey, you can be this. Did you ever think about having a business? Yep. Did you ever think about doing it this way or doing yeah. it that way? Or um, do you not want to go to school? You want to take the money that we saved for you in school and do that? Mm -hmm. It's all about the environment You're right. because that kills some children get killed before they are adults. Mm -hmm. And now they're adults just living this regular life. Um, that's my biggest thing about what they call projects or Section 8. Uh -huh. um, I love the potential there. I find myself even night shift patrolling those areas like I love the potential there because I feel like that if all these people was to find their purpose, it'd be a dangerous place. It would. It would. But the trick of it is, is to make them feel like that you can't and you have to stay here. There's nothing wrong with doing what you have to do until you can do better and get on your mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. But when you are, when you're mentally trained that this is all I got, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to make a certain amount because they're going to put me out. Yeah. And. I laugh all the time because I'm around people in different rooms who say, you know, mom and dad got 500 acres and they do this mm -hmm. and they do that. But can you imagine somebody when they all they got? 
yeah. where they can't call grandma or grandma and be like, can I borrow $20? Mm-hmm. Like when you're it. Yeah. So that's their skit. Like a lot of people talk about sex, but can you imagine the fear? Oh, yeah, of having yeah. to go out here and mm-hmm. and get in a home and then make the bill payment and do all. Yeah. that's fear that's scary to yeah. somebody who's just always had to help. Yeah, because I remember like me and my mom when I was a teenager, we we lost our house, right? So we ended up going to Section Eight, and it was it was a uh, it was an experience for me because for one, I never thought we had a nice home, good neighborhood, front backyard, and gone, right? So I was never one to ride a high horse anyway, but I knew at that point, okay, anything can happen to anybody. But what I realized is some of the kids in the neighborhood never really left the neighborhood, like never went to Walmart, you know what I'm saying? So going shopping for them was going to the corner store and getting like cakes and all that. Um, and then I realized like your your zip code can really shape the outcome of, 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 of what you think is possible. Absolutely. Some so, people, you say like a you know a black policeman, black fireman, black doctor, they'll look at you like what they they got them. You know what I'm saying? Because I think you know, like you said, that's all they've been exposed to. You know, right? So that's why I'm glad that we got you on on the show where they can see that 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 you've been a coach. You know, you're you you know you're doing your motivational speaking thing, and now you're a policeman. So um, let's let's segue to 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 that for a little bit because now you're talking about how you're. In, in the neighborhood. So how did that happen? So I know um, that you're dealing with the kids, you're coaching, and now you're really giving back, back to the community. I'm pretty sure you're seeing kids come from every walk of life. Absolutely. Um, I was, I saw a post about the police department hiring, and along this time, when I started the Hoya program, I would have the chief come out, the former chief, Chief Todd, and um, I would share my vision of, with him about youth and family development. I would share my vision with him. I would ask him to have other officers come out and speak to my teams. So we would do that. So during these little rec practices, at least uh, once a week I have different speakers. He would send somebody out or he would come out mm-hmm. um, speak to the kids. Well, when I seen this uh, ad, I was definitely not comfortable in the school no more because I felt like I maximized my potential. I, f- I wasn't as effective. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm great as coaching, but like actually being here during the day, uh-huh. what am I doing? Yeah. So I was like, um, crazy thing. Because who am I to ask? You a high school dropout. They're not going to hire you at the police department, dude. Mm-hmm. You ain't got a college degree. What are you doing going to a police department? But being around other people um, that's always speaking positive or, or saying, why not? Well, just ask. Like, <laughs> they may not hire you. They may mm-hmm. hire you. So I asked the chief. I was like, just jokingly text him, hey, chief, what do you think about me being a police officer? And in so many words, he was like, the police department would be honored to have somebody like you. Like, what you already do in the community, um, just being a familiar face, like the police could benefit from having an officer like you. So I'm looking at the text, making sure I'm reading it right. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was like, well, it ain't going to hurt to re- apply. I applied and um, went through the police academy. And uh, then that was another barrier. Like, how are you going to get through this? Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. high school dropout, GED, like, you're not going to be able to do it, right? And um, just being able to focus and lock in, and I didn't focus on what I couldn't do. I just took it day by day, gotcha. week by week. Mm-hmm. And every, I, it was a game, mentally. Mm-hmm. Day by day, week by week, because what people don't know is, like, they were saying, like, you know, you in police academy, you focus 120% of police academy. Well, unfortunately, I was focusing on police academy. I was still coaching two teams, mm-hmm. and I still had my kids mm-hmm. that I had to be a daddy to. He's so, like, out. you hear other people, they like, yeah, I'm going home. I'm studying this week. <laughs> I'm about to ace this test and do this, and uh-huh. I'm resting the family. I couldn't do that. Yeah. Whole 21 weeks. I'm coaching two times out the week. We playing um, once – during the weekend, like a little test league, and then mm-hmm. the travel team they playing out of town, <laughs> so like I didn't get that leverage. Yeah. Pulled it off because I took it day by day, week by week, overcome something that I thought I couldn't overcome, mm-hmm. and I became a police officer. I felt different though. When you became a police officer, when I became a police officer, because um, being transparent, I was like, "You're not a police officer." Like, yeah, you passed this, mm-hmm. um, you did this, but. You know, I had people like the former chief of police and um, Captain Hayden. He was a captain uh, for Bedford County Sheriff, Mm -hmm. uh, ran for sheriff also. 
Um, I had people like that say, hey, Travis, like the community could need people like you. Mm -hmm. So then while I looked at it as like, no, I may not be a police officer like everybody else. I looked at it as like, I'm Chick-fil-A of police officers, though. Like every call mm -hmm. I go to, I'm like, how can I serve you? Yeah. Like I'm not necessarily here to enforce law. Like it's times where you got to do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm here like, what's the problem? What's really the problem? Like listening. Yeah. What's really the problem? Can I really help solve it? Um, is there a solvable? Maybe we can just fix it for right now. Mm -hmm. And then it's something fixable later. Um, so that was a role that I had to embrace. And then our new chief, he was big on like, why don't you feel like, like you're great. You do like your policing skills, the way you talk to people. Um, that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. And um, he recently created a new job for me. And I honestly don't feel like I'm working every day. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's amazing, man. That's amazing. But I, I want to continue that story, but I want to dissect part of what you just said, right? So it seems that I think when people are going after dreams and goals, like they look at the limitations, right? And so what I see is like a lot of times we'll stereotype ourselves. I was just doing it, looking at an opening. You know what I'm saying? Just when you look at a job posting, when you look at something, you start stereotyping your your, your yourself. What was your thought process on how to break through that to even go through with it, even though you knew, hey, I don't meet the criteria right now? What was what was your thought process of why you? Because that because if you were to listen to yourself, I would talk myself what, out what, what society says, we would we'd be having a different conversation. The thought process honestly was let the door slam in my face. Mm. I was like, if the door slam in my face, it just mean I wouldn't do it. I remember. Um, and that's why I love being around passionate people. God will put people in your life that do what they do at a passionate level. My barber, to me, may be the best barber in the world, mm -hmm. but that's not why I get my hair cut with him. Like, he's operating his gift. Wow. So, like, I like to be around those people mm -hmm. because when you're around that person, like, they make the th the purpose in you shake. They make the purpose in you think. And it's a it was a purposeful teacher, Miss Patricia McDowell, Liberty Middle School. She said, Travis, if the police don't work out, like, you know we still going to hire you here. Mm -hmm. It made all the sense in the world. Yeah, just try. Like, just do it. Like, yeah. what's the worst going to happen? Like... Liberty Middle School is still going to be here if this don't work. Yeah, yeah. So what I did was I didn't think about what nobody else think. Um, I was like, just let the door close all the way in your face. And that wow. was the way that I went to it. I mean, an academy is a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. three, te three fails, you done. I saw people get put out of academy while I was there. Mm -hmm. Failing tests. Failing um Phys uh, physical fitness, f physical fitness, or just um, I can't think of the word right now, but like tests. So like um, the physical stuff, like the fighting part, the doing your um, officer survival, shooting, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. I'm seeing people drop each week like flies, wow. and then I'm still going right. Meanwhile, I'm there working Monday through Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's my time. Because I tried it. The first two weeks, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I was studying and would still do bad mm -hmm. on the test money. I just started relaxing. Like, Relax. I gave them everything Monday through Thursday. Uh -huh. And then I put me a system together. I was like, we're going to survive. We're going to get out of this mm -hmm. day by day, week by week. Well, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. Because I think a lot of people need to hear that because that actually speaks to me as well. Because sometimes you disqualify yourself. Not knowing, you know what I'm saying, how God has touched the people that are in charge to make the decision because I think some people come through like a traditional thought process well if you don't have these you know the requirements you don't have you know the credentials or meet these expectations but I think you know God's empowering a lot of people to like look I want the best person yeah. for, for the job so now 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 that you're a cop right so you're trying to make that mental you know change where you're like man I'm not a policeman but I am right yeah. so it's kind of hard, hard, hard to believe are there any obstacles that you had to deal with from, you know, from your community um, be, because you, you know, be, became a cop? Did you have any stigma? I would say it was almost vice versa. Um, I was told that when I got sworn in, it was the biggest swearing in ever. Gotcha. And um, everybody showed up. Like, they up. packed it out. It was standing room. Like, people were standing along the walls outside, kids that I formerly coached, girls that I currently coach, parents of kids that I coached. It was slam-packed in there. And um, trying to take an oath, and inside, I just wanted to cry. 
Um, and it was vice versa to answer that question. The community loved me. Gotcha. Because what I did in the community prior to, uh -huh. I felt it may have been stigma because I'm not your everyday cop. I, and I'm not a person who wants the accolades. I never do anything for a trophy. Mm -hmm. I never do anything to be like, oh, he did this. Yeah, It's people who have messaged me like, hey, did you know you was in the newspaper? Uh, no, but thank you. Like, appreciate uh -huh. you letting uh -huh. me know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, some people clip that out. And they cut it up and they hang it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And every trophy that they got, they want everybody to see it or whatever. i never been that type of person. So I guess that was my type. Of, that was my problem as a police officer, where it's like, to be the unperson that's unworthy of it per se, mm -hmm. and they like you don't deserve to be here. Yeah, and then me sitting here and being like, well, I'm here, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and and I know talking to you, just knowing you, as well as this conversation, people can hear your faith in God, right? And I think that had to play a part in you being able to, because a lot of times, I think in life, people don't go after what you know what they want. I think the root cause of that could be they don't feel worthy enough. They see a job, they see an opportunity, they see a significant other that, that they could be with. They don't feel worthy enough. So how does your faith in God help you connect the dots to, to who you are now in uniform? It is vital, man. It is key. Um, it's a struggle because, like, when you say faith in God, some people think of the, like, best pastors in the world. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I struggle where, like, God still choose me. Like knowing Travis, mm -hmm. being far from perfect, being divorced, like God still choose me. My faith in God is vital because I know without him, it wouldn't be like, <laughs> there is no certain algorithm. Travis didn't do nothing great to do, to say that I'm worthy of any of this. Mm -hmm. It's been all him. And, um, I remember being younger, and I guess it's not too, I'm not too old to say this because I'm still considered young, I guess. Um, I felt like the guy was going to use me to teach or like be a pastor or something, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. But then being around people in ministry, having people in my family in ministry, like it hit me in my early 20s that like, what if my life is just my ministry? What if I'm never behind a pulpit? It's powerful, man. What if I'm like, this is the ministry? Mm hmm Like, this is the church. Like, what Like, what if I operate in that aspect of it? Like, no, I'm not going to be perfect, but, like, God can use me in a whole nother different way than he can use other people. Yeah. And when I say that, I'm able to relate to people in so many different ways because I've been through so many different things. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to be transparent about it. And I'm able to tell them, because a lot of people, when God use them, God's so good. Like, he don't even trip when people be like, oh, I did it. Mm -hmm. Like, I woke up every day. I did this. Uh -huh. I did that. But, like, God can really get the glory out of it when it's like, hey, God used me. He can use you. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no respect to person. Yeah. Man, I've been able to help people like that just by saying, um, from the law enforcement side, the first person I arrested, I felt sad. Um, because I heard, hey, that's your first person that you arrested. That's going to be like your criminal for the rest of your life to follow. My faith was like, no, he ain't. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I'm going to do whatever I can do mm -hmm. to help this brother out. Long yeah. story short, end up having to arrest him again. But still, just the opportunity, um, this person was high on drugs. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to him, I said, um, I was able to see the element. I said, you graduate high school? He was like, yeah, I graduated. Young kid, just graduated. I was like, I never even graduated. I was like, don't let this bad decision like affect the rest of your life. So while I saw his body, on, he was on some type of drug or whatever, mm -hmm. a tear came down his eye when I told him that. Wow. So, you got so like to inside of him, something inside of him could relate to that. Like I know I can do better. And a lot of times, that's all people need. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of times when people mess up and they do something wrong, unless they really have a mental problem, they know they did wrong. Yeah. So a lot of times, people just need somebody to encourage them, like, this ain't over. Like, you're going to be all right. So, I mean, just that part of policing 
has um, been amazing to have those type of stories. But then being from the community is also awesome when you go to a house or go to something. They like they don't call me. Cut Travis, like you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so yeah. or to hear that, like oh man, guess who's here? It's Cut Travis. Or going into the elementary schools and they make me feel like I'm Drake. Like I go in and the teacher could be telling them to be quiet, get the line. And when I come through the hallway, they like, Coach Travis, and mm-hmm. they getting out of line. And they giving me hugs. And um, the whole time in my heart, I'm just like, thank you, God. Mm-hmm. Like, to be able to do this, like, that's rich to me. Yeah. Like, no, my bank account ain't rich. But, like, to me, that's rich. I feel like that that's purposeful to be able to get that kid's attention mm-hmm. um, and do it in a positive way. We got yeah. a lot of people who getting kids' attention in a negative way. Exactly. Right, so to be able to have that kind of power, not want it, and know how I got it, I feel like is is important. Yeah, and that's why I'm very careful with this platform, man. Um, I think the most powerful thing you can get is influence, right? Because you have people on the receiving end. Um, I remember my friend was telling me about a lucid dream he had. You know, I didn't know what lucid meant. You know, <laughs> but he was saying that like he was just at he was at the cliff, and there was like people jumping off the cliff or something. And there, was, and there was people, like, coming up, and he was trying to help people up. So he said he had two choices. Either you just like to force people, you know, off the cliff, kill yourself slowly, you know, through lifestyle or whatever. Or he could be a light to actually help people, right? And so I always think about that, man, because it's so easy to just get the influential money, you know what I mean, to get the brand deals if you just do, you know, what's poppy. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think Pick a doing, side. Yeah, because doing right. It's not always the popular thing. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's hard to stand out when you're trying to do, you know, because people hit me up all the time. John, I've seen this podcast. You you should be doing this. Or i seen them having this form. You should talk like this. Or i seen these people talk about this on their platform. But it's not what I was meant to do. It's not what I was called to do. And it's not fair to your creator. Mm-hmm. Like, he, that's cool for them to do that. But, like... It's reasons that whether you know it right now, or whether you'll find out later that like God told me to do this this way, and this is why yep. He told me to do yep. it. Yeah, because I think it's hard for people to follow you when you're carving copies of other people. I just follow the other people. Well, it's hard for you to follow yourself, and it's going to be an identity crisis that you'll eventually hit because yeah. you can't be somebody else. Yeah, and you're thinking that you're not doing something right or you're not worth enough when you're not. No, that's just not you right now. Mm-hmm. That's not where you at. <laughs> yep. That's what's up, man. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, it's a real good way to look at it. Because I think so many people, man, like they have the influence, man. And I think it's all on what are you influencing people to do. And then also people are humble and other people will push their influence on you. Mm-hmm. Because I don't necessarily um, want to influence. But like some people will say, oh, he's this person or he's that person. or mm-hmm. He's so great. Mm-hmm. And he's so like, okay, I'm glad you feel that way, but like, don't push that on me. Like, because mm-hmm. a lot of people will push their titles. They'll exactly. push what they want on you mm-hmm. and do that. And I jokingly tell them, like, feel the same way when you find out that I'm just Clark Kent and I'm not Superman. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what a lot of people will do on you. And I don't want that. Like, I don't want you to put your expectations and your titles on me. Like, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to try to be the best person I can be regardless. Mm-hmm. I appreciate But I don't need all that. But that gives people influence to make them feel like that there's something else. Or mm-hmm. I'm this and I'm that because of what other people do. It's not necessarily yeah. that person, but people at the time can do that. But that go, that comes and goes. Yep. So the same yep. people, when they ain't rocking with you no more or yeah. whatever else, then they're giving that same thing that they gave to you to somebody else. So that's why it's important to know who you are. Yeah. So you move accordingly in that situation. Yep. And that goes back to self-awareness because I respect the person that can stand by themselves. Oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure you, you, you probably know people that from the inside of the circle, it looks like they're the one that's making the moves and blah, blah, blah. But really, they don't move unless they get other people to agree. Yeah. And so, my significant other, he, uh, her dad always like, man, you know everybody. Mm-hmm. everybody. I'm like, a lot of people may know me. I know a lot of people. But come to my house any day out the week and see how many people you see me sitting mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. It's me and my kids. <laughs> yeah. It's me and my significant other. I don't hang out around a lot of people. My peace is not with a whole lot of people. While I feel like it is my job to serve everybody, in my downtime, I just want to sit down and be at home. Um, 
now even even with this new job, uh-huh. it's tough because yes, I go to work when I go to work, but when you do this job, I'm at work all the time. Yeah. Because if you're a community resource officer, yeah. every time you're in the community, I can't go into Walmart. If I go into Walmart and don't have the conversation, then I'm rude, yep. right? I just really wanted to come and get a loaf of bread and mm-hmm. go. But if, hey, Officer Thomas, hey, you seen this? You seen? I'm rude if I don't carry on that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's tough in that aspect yeah. of it, too. So what do you, so what do you think, and, and, and I'm glad that you're on the platform, but people that may want to go that route, that may want to get into law enforcement, but... Somebody may be in their ear and there's maybe stigma of what their community, what the African American community may say to them. Like I've I've had the privilege of of interviewing um Anthony Andrews, right? He was a firefighter. So I love he's, it. he tried to push his he Great just tries to model. push that. You know what I mean? So I'm I i got a feeling that there could be other kids that may want to travel that path. So what do you say to them or anybody that's interested? Law enforcement like any other thing. If you see the problem, be the solution. I didn't get in law enforcement where I saw the problem. I say that from an aspect of like, I didn't see like when I joined law enforcement that I'm going to make it such a great pace because mm-hmm. the police brutality that's going on in the world because I'm more of a did it happen to me type individual so that I can relate more. Then I can relate to it because mm-hmm. I can speak firsthand. If someone's seeing that and they feel like that they can really help or join the police department, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. I say that because, like, um, uh, if it's a piece of trash on the ground, a lot of people can walk past it. But if it's bugging you that much, like, you sitting over there talking about, I can't believe all these people didn't walk past this trash mm-hmm. and been here all day. It might just be meant for you to pick it up. Yeah. So if they're seeing law enforcement from that angle – of like this is what is wrong. Like do something about it, because time waits for nobody. Yeah. Um. You can be passionate about it. There's we got a lot of people. I think I was talking to you about it earlier. That's like not we got people taking jobs, but they're not passionate about it. Like I wake up every morning and it's like I get to do what I get to. This is a job, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Um. And I love it. But you don't have a lot of people that's passionate about their work. They're going to get a paycheck. Yep. They're yep. going to get the day over with. As soon as it's over with, I'm gone. And that's it. I don't want to hear nothing about it or mm-hmm. whatever. But when you're passionate about it, find something that you're passionate about. If the police, if the way the police handle things um, don't set you, like, go apply. See what you got to do to apply. Um, and apply. I, I love about being about it. Like, a lot of people talk. Mm-hmm. But, like, be the change that you want to be. Got you. Got you. So do you do you look at your career and now that you have an opportunity to like okay I'm gonna use this to change and empower like what are, what are your goals now that you're in that seat? I'm scared. I just had an evaluation, um, an evaluation said you know you did an amazing job in just two years. Um, where do you see yourself in the next three years? Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily I'm scared like terrified. But I'm almost don't want to think too far that I mess up something vital right now. Got you. Um, so it's a balance. Why I think it's always good to have a plan and to have a vision, I think it's also good to be like, um, every day I ask God, help me see you in everything. What's your plan for me today? Because mm-hmm. like, I think we all say, I want to do this and I want to do that. But to me, I visualize when people say walk with God, um, can you think about the first time you started walking and you just like taking it step by step. But then as you get comfortable walking, you just move at your speed. Mm -hmm. Well, now we comfortable walking or whatever. And then we turn around and like, where God at? And you might really miss out on something because he not there. And, um, I, I couldn't tell I I wouldn't if you would have asked me this three years ago I couldn't tell I wouldn't have told you I was gonna be a police officer mm-hmm. so part of that kind of tells me that like I don't know I'm up for any challenge mm-hmm. um, I do believe like youth and family development is definitely my purpose um, I definitely feel like using my platform like it ain't my platform it's God's platform but that's hard. Because mm-hmm. if I just, me making that statement right now, people judge you, right? Mm-hmm. 
God's platform. How you say God? You ain't, yeah. Whatever. Like they mm-hmm. gonna think every bad thing they can say about you, mm-hmm. they gonna say about you. But that's where I want to be, wherever he want me to be. And I want to be disciplined enough to be able to enjoy that. Um, but that's hard. It is, it is man. Um, so I think as we segue to maybe the last segment, the last segment, how how did you get introduced to God and being in the faith? Um, jokingly, I always say this, but it's the truest statement ever. I um, my faith was built. My mom struggled with crack cocaine my whole life, but my mom was like growing up had the strongest prayer life ever. Mm-hmm. Where. I will remember her being in the room and praying and me feeling like the presence of God. But she was on drugs. So, but I've been around church people and don't feel like that. Mm. And I'm around a lot of church people where, like, this ain't judgmental, Mm -hmm. but it's like, you represent the guy. Like. Yeah. Our creator, mm-hmm. right? Like, some people decide to go work at Walmart, you know? So if they let Sam Walton down, they let Sam Walton down. But you're <laughs> representing the guy. Yeah. And you moving like this. Yeah. You know? Um, I say that to say I learned more from my mother's praying while she was an addict. That made me, I learned more about that than most preachers ever preaching. Wow. Wow. Because it was more of an action it was more of a, hey, I messed up, but I know I need you. Mm-hmm. I can't explain it, but I know I need you. Um, and my, because I didn't have to go to church growing up. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to church because it was just like a a peace for me. It was a hope for me. But along the way, God show up. And that's why, man, I got friends as Muslims. I got friends that believe in other stuff, and I don't judge them. It's like, um I don't pray for, like, I pray for them as individuals, but, like, God is God. He can show himself to you. Mm-hmm. That ain't my job for him to show you that he got, like, yeah. I'm, I am I need to live a lifestyle accordingly because I'm falling under his discipline. Gotcha. But it ain't my job to, like, try to change you. It's my job to love you. Mm-hmm. It's my job to try to understand you. It's my job to try to get the best person out of you because if i really love you right Mm -hmm. i think a lot Mm -hmm. of times we make church a lot difficult yeah like is this is the church we got to go here and uh i was joking with my significant i was like being a pastor would be a great side hustle because you see people do it with no no conviction anything let's have fun Mm -hmm. let's go out here and you know but like my relationship with God was based off of that and being based off of um, I know him. Like, I know where there was no way. Mm-hmm. And he made a way. That's what's up. I know him where he was, like, just being there and he was confident. And I, I didn't have the person to talk to, so I would mm-hmm. talk to him. But then you would come and tell me something that we was just talking about that, like, affirmed it, like, wow, you know? And just keeping me, like, and being here – I didn't do anything. Like, none of this was calculated. I didn't mm-hmm. sit here and was like, this is how I'm going to do that. And sit. I mean, it's times where I wanted to self-destruct. Like, it was times where I wanted this, and he didn't want that for me. So he closed doors, and I was like, that sucks, and you must don't love me. But then he got me over here. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I think my relationship with God has just been more of embracing life, embracing the ups and the downs. Um, some people feel like if everything ain't going for you good in life, then you ain't got God. And that ain't true. Mm-hmm. Like it's periods and times where like life is here and you just need to be humble and take that part of life that's going, which he's still with you. Yeah. You know, but the older people would be like, God never leaves you nor forsake you. But like he never leaves you or forsake you. So how can he be right on time? Mm-hmm. They say he's an on time guy. Like he left. Mm-hmm. He's always been there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Way to think about it though. So, um, and that's the thing that um, I feel like that I won't be perfect about at all because that's always been a misconception. Some people make you feel like that you got to be perfect. Uh Like having a relationship with God isn't giving you like a key to sin, but I think a lot of people paint the picture to make you feel like that you're as far from God as this when you do something wrong, Mm -hmm. and that ain't his relationship. I mean, he didn't talk me through that through my kids. Like a lot of times when I'm dealing with my kids, I think of like how God deals with me. 
So I can't be like so harsh on my children. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I'll create a discipline, but like, God, like, remember when you did that? Or you had a kid, um, I done did this before at, at Walmart, and one of your kids say, Can you put that on the line? You don't deserve that. And then God, like, Oh, do you deserve everything you got? Mm -hmm. Like, just put it on the line, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And get it. So um, yeah. that's definitely been um, a vital part. It will always be a vital part. It's my okay. relationship with God. Okay. So I definitely want to get you back for Absolutely, part two, man, to get more into like your backstory, like, you know, you and your moms and. The other stuff that, that you have been through to really help, you know, not only motivate people, but inspire people that they can make it to. Absolutely. And I think that's why we wanted to start you and Uniform going back to, you know, so somebody will hopefully see this interview and say, hey, you know what? If he can do it, then I can do it. You know Absolutely. what I mean? So as, as, as we close, I want you to look into your camera. If you want to give somebody um, like a one to two minute Insp you know, inspiring word, you know, really not giving up, overlooking their circumstances, what would you say to them? Um, if I could say anything to anybody to inspire them is just keep getting up. My mom was big on saying I'm either up or I'm getting up. Um, never count yourself out. The body is a miracle. You're a miracle. Like, you got to keep going. A lot of people quit just by not showing up. It's power in showing up. So that would be my thing to motivate you. Make sure you pri prioritize a relationship with God um, and make sure you try to find your purpose. The reason why I stress that is because, like, to me, purpose is seed. If I, if, if all of our purpose is seed, and if it's properly planted, like, God is the natural thing that happens. So God will be the rain. God will be the light to make that seed flow. So those are the things that you have to prioritize. You have to prioritize a relationship with God, and then you need to find that purpose so that you can plant that seed in the earth. Cool, cool. And I hope you guys listen to that. You know, um, as, as we close, I want you to think about some things that he said, you know, but people suffer from depression because they focus on the past. People suffer, suffer from anxiety and being anxious because they focus on stuff that hasn't happened yet, the the future. Just like Travis said, there's nothing wrong with wanting things to, to happen, but live in the moment. And when you live in the moment, it kind of combats both of those things at the same time, being thankful who you are, where you are, and grinding and pushing forward. And, um, and as I said before, please like, please subscribe, please share this conversation so we can try to help other people that would listen to this conversation and then it gets to the ears that it was meant to, to get to. And as I always say, one love, but it's your choice. I say it again. It is your choice to be blessed. Peace. Hey, what's up? It's your boy Teflon John, and I would like to personally thank you for listening to this episode of the Art of Reinvention Podcast show. Follow us on social media on TikTok at the Reinvention Podcast, YouTube at the Art of Reinvention Talk Show, and Instagram at the Art of Reinvention Podcast. And you can hit us up at www.teflonjohn.com. That's John spelled J-O-H-N for all motivational content in Teflon Radio. And again, as I always say, one love, but it's your choice to be blessed.